Hey there, everybody. Welcome to WIC Live. We are back after the holiday break. We were just discussing and catching up. We hope you guys had a great holiday. We're back to, glad to be back with you all. Yeah, Happy New Year. Good to see you guys again. Julie Davies, Happy New Year all. First <laughs> comment of the year. Glad to see you guys. Hey, Liz. Hey, Luca. Hey, everyone. It's good to see you guys back. Hey, oh, no. Is Dan going to sing, Julie asked. Should I? Yeah. Do you have... Is there something I don't For know about? all the acquaintance oh. be forgotten, ever brought to mind. There you go. Dan! Right? Did you ever do musical theater? No. I feel like you could have done that. I was that. in choir in elementary school. Okay, there it is. Anyway, we are back. This is Wick Live, and we're going to be talking about all things Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire. Oh, we have um, a long 2018 to get through, Kayla. <laughs> <laughs> While we wait for... Oh, right. This is the year where we don't have any new Game of Thrones. There's no new Game of Thrones this year. But it doesn't mean we can't talk <laughs> about anything. For example, to kick it off, we're going to give away a copy of the Game of Thrones Season 7 Blu-ray box set. Whoa. Which um, includes, you know, all seven episodes of the last season. It includes special features, 11 audio commentaries, um, history and lore featurettes, a full 45-minute featurette on Aegon's Invasion of Westeros, animated... Very cool show, very cool um, set, and we're going to give it away in a little bit. I'll ask a trivia question um, in a bit after we get through some of the Game of Thrones news before Josh comes on for A Song of Dan and Josh, our continuing journey through A Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> <sighs> that was a lot. It was. And you've been busy. You've got some spoilers for us? I do. Well, first I thought we'd talk about just some New Year stuff. So it's okay, a New Year, let's do that. 2018, yep. and Game of Thrones made huge waves. It's still the biggest show in the world by a lot of different measures, including one of them. You may be interested to know, Kayla, in 2017, Game of Thrones was the most discussed show on both Facebook and Twitter, with a total wow. of 2,556 million interactions per episode. That's crazy. The number one show, which is not surprising. It doesn't surprise me, yeah. The runner-ups were Walking Dead, Empire, This Is Us. <gasps> love This Is Us. And then in fifth place, The Bachelor. Ah, love The Bachelor. Of course. <laughs> Game of Thrones is, is still running high. There's nothing else on TV like it. There really isn't. Um, it's starting to kind of sink in. How, how singular do you think this kind of thing is? Like, how often does a show that dominates... I want, I want to point out, not only does it have the most social media interactions over 2017, it beats the second place person by nearly three times. There's nothing, there's never been something of this magnitude, right? I mean, maybe, I don't know, the MASH finale? That was watched by a lot of people. <laughs> you always bring up MASH. I always bring up Friends. <laughs> but still, I don't think it was an, well, and then social media adds a whole other element to that, which we didn't have with those shows. The other flip of that is it was also the most pirated show for the, um, you know, seventh year in a row, um, or at least for the fourth or fifth year running with, and I'm quoting here, according to Musso, just over a billion times episodes were pirated of season seven this year. A billion Whoa. in 2017. A billion. Wait, that's a bad thing, right? Well, um, yes, it is an illegal <laughs> okay, just, thing. Okay, that's what I thought, yes. It's good and it's bad. It's like, it's one of those things where, do I take this as a compliment? You can. It it's like shows its popularity, right. It's popular. I mean, over a billion times, can you imagine how much money they're losing if anybody who pirates it actually like paid a penny for it, they would have like $100 million. That's crazy. It's insane. Mind-boggling. I mean, but also, you're right. It's, 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 it's an insult, but it's also a compliment. <laughs> and I, 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 I don't know how they can stop it. And it's, it's a runaway train with that thing. Other pirated things with The Walking Dead, The Flash, Big Bang Theory, and Rick and Morty. Do you think that has anything to do with it being on HBO? Um, yeah, of course. Um, I think it's... Uh, yeah, HBO is not quite as accessible right. as... CBS or something. But then again, like uh, another one of the top pirated shows was The Big Bang Theory. That's a, that's a network show. CBS? I think it I is. I think. Yeah. I, mean, maybe, I think it's CBS. <laughs> you can watch that whenever. But um, yeah, it just keeps on going. And yes, Julie, um, I'm sorry, but the giveaway <gasps> is US only, um, as usual. Sorry about that to our international viewers. Sometimes we get to do international giveaways. Um, if, if the circumstances are right, not this time. When we have like physical copies, it's a little harder to do with our with our rules, but we'll we'll try. Maybe uh, we can send Julie a postcard. Maybe we can. <laughs> we should. We owe her that. We do. Happy New Year, Daniel, to everybody. Anyway, now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about some minor teases and spoilers for Game of Thrones season eight. It's always happening. Yep, and it's just going to get juicier throughout the year. 
Or they'll get really good and they'll tighten the noose and not have anything come out. Or that. But uh, the cast was talking up um, the, season, the season seven box set release and said some interesting things about the ending. Because you know, they're in the place now, they know the ending. Mm -hmm. There are people in the world who know how the show ends, finally. <gasps> after, you know, 25 years of wondering with this story. Um, Isaac Hempstead Wright plays Bran, talking to Hollywood Reporter, saying, it won't go the way some people want. It will be too happy for some people, or too sad, or too whatever. That's the nature of an ending. Which is, do you think that's a... Uh, that's very vague. It is very vague. Um, do, 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 do you think it's discouraging at all, that it won't what people want? I mean, you can't please everybody. No. Like you said, great. some people will like it, some people won't. They'll be happy, they'll be sad. It'll be good, it won't. I don't yeah. know. And mostly that was echoed throughout the other people. Like Ben Crompton, who plays Dolores Ed, said that, uh, you know, whatever we do, there'll be fans who will love it and fans who won't be satisfied. I'd be surprised people are disappointed because there's a lot of effort and love going into this, and I think it's very satisfying. I mean, I don't know. I think if you really loved it, part of me says you would just say, it's the best thing ever, it's remarkable. I do that with everything I love, no matter what. What do you mean, like hedge? Like Taylor Swift. <laughs> oh, you mean... When, like when you when, like something and you're loves, into it. You're effusive about it. Right. But these Not people everyone loves her, I do. are, I mean, I don't know, they seem to be a little more cautious. And I think if they really did love it, they would just go whole hog into their enthusiasm. But then again, they are British. So we have to remember that. Mm -hmm. That, hope I'm not offending anybody. Um, <laughs> they have uh, a, an admirable reserve to them. And they're like, you know, we can't know until it happens. It's, right. It's, it's more of a, a laid back thing, is my hypothesis. Any chance Ed Sheeran will come back in season eight? Oh, Ed Sheeran. Yes. Um, Speaking of British. I don't see why not. He's going on The Simpsons. He's making the rounds. One can only hope. Cameos. You know, there was a funny um, uh, kind of, the, the Spanish equivalent of April Fool's Day is uh, December or January 1st or 2nd or recently. And there's, <laughs> the a, there's a story that was going around that uh, Justin Bieber have a small cameo in season eight. And it got a lot of penetration until I figured out, oh, this is a Spanish outlet. And this is Spanish April Fool's Day today. How long do they have you going? I mean, the tweet got like well over a thousand likes that I put up. Wow. I wouldn't hate that. I'm also a Biebs fan. Some people did hate the idea of it. <laughs> I'm sure. Quite a lot of them, actually. Not everyone, though. Okay. I think it'd be fun. It I, thought, be I thought that Aria's Ed Sheeran thing was interest. ridiculous. The the con what controversy over it. Oh, who cares? It's a musician on the thing. He didn't ruin anything. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he could be Barely cool. talked. Are, he didn't, yeah, well, he did have a line. <laughs> Julie Davies says, imagine how we're going to feel whilst watching the final episode. I think I'm going to cry. Dan, mm. are you going to cry? It, I mean, it depends if it's good or not. Has any episode ever made you cry? It's a good question. I, I, don't, I don't remember. I think probably. Just curious. I think probably. I often cry at movies and TV. Same. And um, <laughs> even commercials. Not com so much commercials, but... Uh, There's some really touching commercials. I get there. emotional. And um, <laughs> yes, I, I can't like point to a moment where it happened, but I'm, I'm, I, I think it's maybe happened before. I'm, I'm very invested in the show, so... What you are. I, I mean, you're you? literally... It's li your life. <laughs> in, in a way, it's my life. <laughs> How about you? Are there ones that made you cry? Um, maybe the one with... The daughter being burned alive. Yeah, I was thinking. I wasn't crying. I, I was I don't horrified remember. during yeah. that. I yeah. remember. I remember seeing that for the first time, sitting in my chair, like going, it, "It's not. They, they, can't, they can't do it. They can't do it. They can't do it. They can't do it." And just like being on the edge of my seat, gripping the thing, like mm -hmm. being just stark terrified. I didn't cry. It wasn't that kind of scene, but I was. I was very upset. I don't. That's the only one I remember. Like maybe Stanis getting to daughter. Head. Yeah. Oh God, it was rough. Awful. Anyway, in happier news, we have. Uh, some behind the scenes info about Game of Thrones season eight. We have confirmation on something we reported, I think a couple of weeks ago, about a pair of cast members introduced in season seven returning for season eight. We got two, two minor ones. These are minor spoilers right now. So put in your minor earplugs if you don't want to hear it. <laughs> Although I think you'll be fine. This isn't anything earth shattering. We got two people coming back. Oh, oh, Lisa J. Heckler said when John and Sansa were reunited, that was pretty emotional. <gasps> Yes. She may have cried at that point. I, I don't think I cried. I was moved, though. I was definitely moved, like, because just, 
I love the fact that that's earned over, you know, five seasons right. of pain. There's been so much hope for that. Yes, and there was just a catharsis mm -hmm. when they uh, when they hugged. That, that's definitely a good. I'm trying to think now. Have I cried during the show? <laughs> I'm sure I have, but I can't pinpoint a moment. But that's a good one when John and si John's reunited. Anyway, think about it and come back to us next I week. Will. <laughs> Two characters re uh, coming back from season seven. We got Harry Grasby and Megan Parkinson, the actors who played young Ned Umber and Alice Karstark, respectively. You may remember them in the first episode, um, we touched on this a couple weeks ago, where they were trying to decide what to do with the Karstark and Umber castles. Sansa wanted to give them to people who were loyal to them. John was like, no, let's forgive them and give them to the kids in the family mm -hmm. who are Ned Umber and Alice Karstark who are these young leaders, the next generation of Northern leaders. I don't know how I feel about them. How do you know? How do you mean? I just feel like they're gonna become their parents. I mean, it'll take a while. That is a good point though. I mean, a, a large part of the show and the story I think is about the fallout from this Robert's Rebellion that we didn't, that happened years before the story happened. Where King Robert took the throne, sent Daenerys over the sea. And what does Daenerys do? She grows up and becomes an invading dragon queen. Right. <laughs> and you know, what does Jon Snow, who was born during that time, do? He grows up and becomes a leader of men and a secret Targaryen and all that stuff. What does Cersei do? She nurses her grudges for 16 years and then becomes <laughs> an evil queen. Blows people up. It, 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 Game of Thrones really is the story of the 16-year the fallout from that time bomb planted at the end of the story. And I, 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 I think history's like that, mm -hmm. where you, you look at one event, World War I, for example, and then you can kind of see the seeds for World War II planted there, and then they sprout. They take 20 years to sprout, but they sprout. Yep. And I, I think it keeps that in mind, which I think is one of the things that kind of sets it apart from other stories, that it does have that big picture outlook. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're right, Kayla. So maybe these two kids will, uh, <laughs> it's a bad idea to keep them in power, because they can grow up to be like their parents, and right. um, who's, I mean, Jon Snow basically killed both their fathers in battle, but still killed them. But the other argument is, if you forgive somebody, you remove the thorn from that, and you open the path to a relationship, and it doesn't fester. Wow, that's deep, Dan. I'm extremely deep. I've had two <laughs> weeks to marinate and think about these things. <laughs> All the acquaintance be forgotten. <laughs> but they're coming back, um, both of them. I, I think it'll be interesting. It's nice to have some other characters in the mix, other yep. characters who could die, maybe. That's always nice. There are definitely ones that could die. You gotta have people in the mix who you might be able to sacrifice in the first, second episode. True. Also, but they're kids though, so I don't know if I want that. Oh, right. But we'll see what role they play come 2019. We also have a new actor named <laughs> Seamus O'Hara, who will play a character named Fergus. Just Fergus, that's fine. Everything about that is so Irish, I, I can What's barely his stand name? it. Seamus. Seamus, playing Fergus. Seamus O'Hara playing Fergus. Ah. All of those names are Irish as hell, which is fine. <laughs> go Seamus O'Hara. So that's happening. We don't, we don't know who he's going to be, though. And finally, before we give away the Game of Thrones Season 7 box set. So earmuffs off. Yes, earmuffs that. off. Well, yeah, and blindfold on. Here is a uh, one little set picture for you guys. It's a set picture from um, the giant set they're building in Titanic Studios in Belfast, which I, I think we can reveal now is King's Landing. I mean, there's nothing else it could be. I, I'm going to say that's now on the table. Is that confirmed? I mean, it's if you don't watch Look for Game of Thrones, spoilers, no. Okay. But if you're watching this show, I think you're, I think you're grown up enough to handle it. It's King's Landing. They're building a giant King's Landing set. Here's a tower from it. It's been completed. Got the stonework on it. It used to be like a bear uh, naked wood thing, so it's been cool to see it progress. Oh, very cool. And we'll see where that goes in the future. So exciting. Good stuff, Dan. Kayla, it's so good to see you again. You too. I missed you. Two weeks off. Thank guys you all back. Good to see you back. And before we have Josh Hill on, oh, uh, I got a couple of questions here really quick. Uh, Matt asked, when is the final season? We don't know exactly, Matt, but sometime in 2019. Sorry if you're just getting that news now. And Hunter wants all the spoilers. Well, that's what we're here for, Hunter. Good. Check out when is coming for that night for more. Anyway, Kayla, thank you. Thank See you, Dan. See you next Dan. week here See on you guys Wednesday next at 4 week. p.m. CST and Wick Live and the Facebook page. Anyway, okay, we're going to give away the Game of Thrones Season 7 Blu-ray box set. 
I'm going to ask a trivia question. You guys are going to email your answers to the email address that is hopefully on your screens right now. Uh, the way it works is the first person to give me a correct email address, I'm going to get back to them, say, you won. Congratulations. And then you're going to respond to me with you know, your address, your full name, so I can ship this out to you. If you don't get back to me in 24 hours, I, I have to go to the next person who gave me their right answer. So just keep that in mind. So, OK, trivia question. Send me your answers to dan.selke at winneriscoming.net. Trivia question is this. The Umber family, we've been talking about them, uh, Ned Umber. What is the name of their house seat? Every house in Game of Thrones has a seat or a castle all their own. The Starks have Winterfell. The Lannisters have Casterly Rock, the Tyrells have Highgarden, so on and so on. What is the name of the Umber's house seat? What is the name of the Umber castle? Send your correct answer in. I will get back to you, and we will announce the winner at the end of the show. And between now and then, we have on the lovely and talented Josh Hill, who it's true. we are going to talk <laughs> about um, our ongoing journey through a Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire. Yeah. We, we have a th little thing here called A Song of Dan and Josh. Josh, where you and I talk about the books, go through it chapter by chapter, yeah. analyze it, talk about it, suss it out, try to pull out the themes and the important things. I've read all the books. Josh has read none of them, none first of them. time through. So we're taking this journey together. And it's been a little while. Josh, how was your break? It was pretty good. I read three chapters of Game of Thrones over my break, so it was uh, fun. Yeah, Yeah, you had plenty of time to do it. Plenty of time. Are, are you finding that you want to read more? Yeah, I mean, good. each week it seems like more sign. and more want to dive deeper and deeper inside of these characters' heads. Good. I think hopefully as a narrative picks up momentum, you'll want that even harder. <clears throat> yeah. So we read some interesting ones this week. Uh, let's start with uh, Bran, the third Bran chapter, mm -hmm. which is one of the more, I think, uh, free-form chapters, maybe in the whole series. Yeah. Because it's basically just a big dream sequence. Yeah. Bran is still um, unconscious from being pushed out a window by mm -hmm. Jamie. And he's just basically tripping balls. Pretty much. So, so what happens in this chapter? What stood out to you? Well, I mean, the, reading the whole chapter, I was reminded of there's an episode of The Simpsons where oh, yeah. Homer, he eats the like, insanely hot pepper. Of course. And then he goes on this weird like, <clears throat> Native American spirit journey thing. So and it reminded me of that because like, Johnny Cash is this fox that keeps talking to him. I remember. And that reminded me of The Crow, the three-eyed raven in this, I can totally in, see in that. this chapter. I kept going back and forth between those two because the crow kept popping up. And then, like, Bran would see, you know, Catelyn and Roderick go off to King's Landing and the storm clouds and mm -hmm. all this kind of really, you know, it's not on the nose stuff, but not nice, nice It's form kind of on of. the nose. But it's a I dream thought. sequence, so it kind of has to be. So well, I, I mean, liked it, though. Yeah, I enjoyed it, too. Uh, I mean, I think there are some people who, who don't do it on the nose. There, there are people who write dream sequences and it's very yeah. opaque. I mean, I think the way Martin writes them, it's, it's fairly on this. I, I wrote down some things here. Like, uh, there were shadows all around them. One shadow was dark as ash with the terrible <laughs> face of a hound. I wonder who that could be. It's the hound, people. Not exactly <laughs> subtle. Not that it has to be. No, but it's not just, really. it's, it's, it's not. Yeah. Another was armored like the sun, golden and beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think it's a clear Jamie reference. And then finally, over them both loomed a giant in armor made of stone, but when he opened his visor, there was nothing inside but darkness and thick black blood. Who's that? I wonder. Who is it? I think that's King Robert. I would think so. That's kind of where I was going with it. Yeah, which again, actually, that, that's, that's a little um, more vague. A little bit, but the premonitions that Bran had here, I really felt, you know, we talk about these, these chapters developing where these characters are going to go, and everything that we've seen on the show from him, not to like keep comparing the two. No, no, absolutely do. But, I think it's interesting. But you know, where I know that Bran is going in the mm -hmm. seasons that we've just seen, where he is growing more mystical and more powerful in his wizardry ways, whatever you want to call it, this really kind of foreshadowed all that because he's kind of, he's seeing these things. He has this vision. Not only just the vision that he's seeing, but he has the vision of like seeing yeah, things. Yeah, he has the literal like third sight or third. Yeah, he has like the it. shining or something like that. So <laughs> yes. you know, it's and I really I enjoyed how free form kind of the chapter was. It was fun. It was a little bit of a departure from 
you know, these char- these chapters do go in the characters' heads, but they feel very structured. It's like here's we're inside of Ned's head, now we're inside of Catelyn's head, now we're inside of Arya. But this was kind of all over the place, and it reminded me also of the chapter we had with Catelyn earlier, like the first half of her chapter. She was that, kind yeah. of losing her mind, and then she snapped out of it. And this time, you know, Bran eventually wakes up. He realizes that he's paralyzed. You know, his dire wolf is there, Summer, which he names. So, you know, all of it, it was a really good chapter that I felt moves Bran's character forward from, oh, he's a poor crippled boy into, well, there's more here. You know, you don't have to have your legs to then have him go on this journey. You know, he can literally just dream it up. Yeah, it gives a great impression yeah. that he really is going places. Uh, really quick interruption. I, one comment, uh, Alyssa, h- help with the email because we didn't see it full. It's um, dan.selke, D-A-N dot S-E-L-C-K-E, at winterscoming.net. Hope that helps. Good luck. Ooh, also, Kevin says, I like when you guys do trivia more, please. That can be kind of fun. That would be fun. Just a full-on trivia thing. Yeah, it, it was a nice change of pace. And I agree with you. It does give a good impression that um, he's something special, yeah. that we're keeping him around for a reason. One of the, uh, the ones I just want to highlight really quick is that... Um, this is really the only time in the whole book series, or the show even, where we kind of get a glimpse of something we haven't even seen in the show yet, which is where the White Walkers live. Yeah. It's this north and north and north he looked to the curtain of light at the end of the world, some cosmology there. And then beyond that curtain, he looked deep into the heart of winter, and then he cried out afraid. Yeah. Like, that's, that's pretty juicy. And that's, I mean, the show is, is about geography so much, mm-hmm. where everyone is over this huge space. Yeah. And it's interesting... And um, a, a big moment to go somewhere geographically. We have not been yet, even as the story is sprawling as this. Which again makes me wonder what he has planned for when we finally do get there. Yeah. I, well, wasn't there an episode in the show where we kind of saw like the children of the forest or something like that? And like the Night King before he was the Night King and that we kind did. of thing. So that kind of reminded me of this a little bit. But oh, yeah, totally. Where yeah. the White it's, it's come the mystical from, area. Yeah. yeah. So. I also liked your Simpsons reference because it was it just me or is that crow a little like cheeky and almost modern (laughs) sounding? Yeah, I was like, this is, I was totally seeing that Simpsons episode in my head and I was just like, this is, you know, I almost started like thinking, is it going to talk like Johnny Cash now? I wonder. Like there's that one bit where Brand's like, I'm flying and the crow's like, I can see that. And like you're bringing in like sitcom sarcasm to this. It was a little, it was fun, but he he sounded different than like the other characters a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. And I I mean, I think Martin's a good enough writer that that's intentional. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what, Maybe maybe the three eyed because this is the three eyed raven he's talking yeah. to, which is the crow in the book. Yeah, I do not know why they changed that. By the way, ravens are cooler than crows though. Crows it, are annoying. Ravens are kind of cool. The letter V is awesome. Put it that is. in your thing. Smoke it. Um, well, you'd think that the author would go for the raven, like Edgar Allan Poe. Like you'd think yeah. he'd you know not the show, but but I just had an idea. Maybe the three eyed crow or raven because he can travel through time can like go in, into the deep future and watch sitcoms. That's why he sounds more like a modern character. It's true. That's Maybe a, he's seen That's a Game new fan theory I have right now. The, the three-eyed raven knows the end of Game of Thrones. Exactly. It has seen the future. All right, back in the non-trippy portion of our evening, uh, let's go to the fourth Catelyn chapter. Plot's mm-hmm. really picking up steam now. Yep. She's heading to King's Landing. Mm-hmm. Um, another, looking back, another really important chapter is because of the elements it introduces it's the first time we see Varys, first yep. time we see Littlefinger. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's I, oh, actually, this is, the, this is our first King's Landing visit, isn't it? Yep, Red, uh, Red Keep. There was Because we saw it through Catelyn's eyes, which was interesting, and not seeing it through Ned's eyes. Yeah. I think that was a note that you had, too, that stuck out to me. That And I liked that, because Ned, it feels like, is a little more sympathetic towards the Lannisters because of Robert, because he's in. Robert's his boy. He, he had more of a history. He seems a little more diplomatic than, than Catelyn does. And I liked seeing King's Landing the first time through her eyes because she is just so cold and so anti-Lannister. And it was very kind of foreign going to this place. And she For almost sure. was kind of like, you know, the, the Lannisters are the ones that are always thumbing their nose at people, it seems. And it was nice to see Catelyn go here. And it felt through her, like, the way that she was seeing things that she was almost thumbing her nose at the rich and this, you know, the castle and all this kind of stuff. So I, I, I liked yeah. that. Yeah, I liked it too. I also liked, again, this like far-reaching thing. I mean, she lays out the geography of the city in ways that will become really important later. The mm-hmm. Red Keep, obviously huge. Yep. I mean, the Sept of Baelor, Cersei blows that to hell mm-hmm. in the six, at season six, long time. She mentions the Dragon Pit too. They had that yep. giant meeting in the last one. Mm-hmm. And those are things that won't come into play in a serious way for a long time. Mm-hmm. But here they are. They're all ready for us, just sitting there to be used in a, 
a big epic plot set piece <laughs> five, six years down the line. So I, I always like that uh, forecast, a vision he has. Good question. Oh, what's up? Uh, we have a question. Is this the first time Caitlin has ever been to King's Landing? Do we know? I think it is. Um, I do think this is the first time catlin has been to King's Landing. Mm. Just because the way she talks, I mean, she grew up at River Run, we know yep. that. And then I think she got shipped off to the north. You know, this is like fake medieval times, so it's like she's 15 years old. I don't think she had a chance to go to King's Landing before. I think it's her first time, so it, it helps to see it through a foreigner's perspective. I got that, from, I got that impression from her descriptions. It just yeah. felt like she was seeing this for the first time. And that makes more sense, too, narratively. Like, she's seeing it for the first time, we're seeing it for the first time. I mean, you're not going to go inside this character's head and describe it like she's seeing it for the first time if she hasn't. So mm -hmm. that, to me, I never yeah. really kind of doubted. I was like, oh, yeah, this is the first time she's been to King's Landing. And again, that's useful for readers, because mm -hmm. obviously we have to King's Landing either. Yeah. So if you're going to describe it, describe it from a character who hasn't been there so you can get that fresh experience. Mm -hmm. Which I'm just getting now is why he put it in Catelyn's head, not Ned's, because Ned yeah. has been there before. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, Plot-wise, I think we also get a good thematic tease in this idea that Catelyn tries to play the Game of Thrones. She tries to do the sneaky thing. She tries to like send her master at arms to go talk to the other guy. Yep and then she's gonna hide out in this hotel. Mm -hmm. Like, she's fooling herself. They're what, like eight steps ahead of her. Right. Varys knew she was coming from a long time ago. They get her, they bring her back. And that's a recurring theme with the Starks, that mm -hmm. they, they never see this stuff coming. Like, they yeah, don't, they don't see, see the yeah. red wedding coming. Nope, Ned not. does not see his own execution coming. Nope. He thinks he's gonna be triumphant there. And Catelyn is, is like a Stark. She tries to do this sneaky thing, and it's just, it's, she's way out of her element. Mm -hmm. And um, she's outfoxed by Littlefinger and Varys. Yeah. What were your impressions of Littlefinger and Varys? How, how they compare to the show? What'd you get? Uh, what'd well, you get I mean, they were scheming from the start, so and that makes sense. That completely plays into their characters that I've come to know on the show. It's mm -hmm. like, for, and that was perfect. That was a perfect introduction to these two characters because you know you talk about how George R. R. Martin's been really good at giving us just kind of this full scope right away of things, whether it's the world building, whether it's you know literally going inside of characters' heads. And then you have Varys and Littlefinger. Right off the bat, you're like, these guys are skeezy. These guys are, you know, they're slimy, but they're incredibly smart. They and they do will come off be, of skeezy and slimy. Yeah. They will be six steps ahead of you no matter what, which is, makes them dangerous and scary. So I really liked that. Um, you know, Varys, from where he goes, I kind of miss his interactions with Littlefinger. I kind of forgot that they, too. they were I going like back too. and forth. I mean, I remembered in the show, I was like, oh yeah, because I can place it, but I kind of, I kind of miss that because now he's so closely associated with Daenerys and, and, Interior, and Tyrion and, and everything like that. Times. But yeah, and Littlefinger right off the bat, you just, I, I didn't like him. <laughs> it's, I mean, he describes him as like a little pointed chin beard. Yeah. You can't like that. He's like a weasel. It's like... Oh. Know, he was always a clever boy, but he was yeah. trying to get out of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, apparently he can throw knives in the book. Like, he doesn't have that skill in the show. Well, <laughs> Like, he takes the dagger and he throws it into the door frame. Yeah. And it's like, oh, what? You can, you can do that? I didn't mm -hmm. know that. Varys, I thought, was very close to what I, who he was in the show. Yeah. Like, this one little line I wrote down, just because it, it so said Varys to me, uh, it was... Buh, 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 buh. Okay, well, I can't find it. But it was there. Oh, the man who stepped through the door was plump, perfumed, powdered and as hairless as an egg. His flesh yep. was soft and moist, and his breath smelled of lilacs. I thought they really went for that. Mm -hmm. Although, it, it, I mean, it, it's also the issue of perspective, too, because Varys, as we know, really, he has that part. He's not like that all the time. No. Like, he puts on a show a lot of the time, and he's, I mean, they, they both may be skeevy, Littlefinger and Varys, but Varys is working more for the angels than Littlefinger is, certainly, yeah. and puts his scheming toward a good purpose. Exactly. But again, Catelyn is, is a stranger. She doesn't know mm -hmm. these things. So to her, they're both disgusting. Yeah. I mean, you can't blame her, too. And I do like how, how Varys is like Littlefinger, but he's different in that, you know, to use his powers for good, I guess you could say, because it does show that you have to play the Game of Thrones to yes. know, to survive, basically, because there's no coincidence that those two characters, or character now, have been along or around so long because mm. they know how to play the game. So, and, and Catelyn's perspective of the two, of them being the same, is a perfect you know, encapsulation of their characters because it's, you don't know what's underneath the surface. And those are two characters that never show their hands. Right. So you never know. So Varys, probably a great guy. You know, greater good and everything like that. But you're never going to know because they don't show their hands. And I liked how that was established right away. Right. 
because now you're going to see him from, I don't know if we're going to see him from another character's perspective, but if we I do. We do, because just spoiler alert, we, do, we never go inside their heads. No. It's always outside. But like Tyrion had interactions with Varys on the show, so I imagine they would interact oh, yeah, as that well. Oh yeah, pretty true to the books. So I want to see how his perspective is different from Catelyn's, just because, you know, they are characters that are so, they hold it so close to the chest. But right, because know. Tyrion is is more like Varys and Littlefinger, and yeah. that he does play the game better, and he oh, is yeah. a little more of a strategist, and strategist, mm -hmm. and Catelyn is not. Yeah. Catelyn's just more of a surface person, which is why she dies. So, and then plot-wise, uh, we get going because Littlefinger lies about the dagger, says it's Tyrion's, yep. which we now know is not true, but that will lead to Catelyn arresting Tyrion, which will mm -hmm. lead to Tywin trying to get him back, which will lead to Jaime fighting Ned Stark in the streets, which will basically lead to the war. Mm -hmm. So the dominoes are like being like, dink. Yep. That's what we're doing here. And finally, we have uh, the third Jon Snow chapter, which Indeed. is basically... The introduction to the wall. When I was reading this, the first thing that jumped out at me again was um, how damn moody he was. Yeah. And how kind of surly. What was your impression of uh, John Stone in this chapter? Emo John. Emo Go John. Emo completely. John around. Um, I, I like that I had a note here that this is a chapter where John kind of gets humbled a little bit because he does come and he has this attitude. And I remember this was in the show too. It's kind of not, it like, was. not like a holier than thou attitude, but there is enough there where the guys don't trust him. They're like, he's an outsider, he thinks he's better than us. And even though he doesn't really play into that and thinking that he's better than anybody, just his, the way he carries himself gives off the impression that he's not open to these relationships. Yeah. Which is exactly what you have to be I mean, at the wall. He, he thinks, the, Night's I mean, the problem is, like, he is technically better. Mm -hmm. Like, he grew up in a castle, he was trained to use swords and stuff. Yeah. He grew up with gentle, he, he wasn't a nobleman, but he mm -hmm. grew up with noblemen. He had yeah. true-born siblings who were like, you know, the frickin' Starks, like the kings of the north mm -hmm. or whatever. He didn't grow up in, like, a, a shack or a exactly. alley or, you know, just, like, as a peasant. He mm -hmm. grew up in a castle. Yeah. So he is better... But you can't think that. You, no. You're not going to get along with your other people. Yeah. And that's what uh, Donald Nye gives in that speech. Like, you're a bully. You're shaming them, mm -hmm. jackass. And by the way, he's not in the show. Tyrion gives his speech on the show. I was going to say, I, one of my notes was, what is a noy, a nye, or whatever you say. Like, <laughs> what, what is this guy? <laughs> I don't know. Well, what's this guy? But, yeah. Yeah, you'll find, I mean, you'll find that there's a lot of uh, m smaller characters who just, who just d Lumped didn't make it on the show. Ones, yeah. I mean, because I remember the interaction, but I was like, oh, that was, I thought that was Tyrion. And I was like, oh, yeah, it was Tyrion. It was. In the show, it was Tyrion, mm -hmm. which I thought worked just fine because yeah, they have interactions, too. Um, I got the impression during this chapter, I don't know if you picked this up, like, uh, around the time when, like, Alice or Thorne, who's the, mm -hmm. who is the guy who eventually kills Jon Snow, mm -hmm. by the way, um, and, and again, his first introduction, they're already setting up um, that enmity, mm -hmm. which will climax in a big way five years down the line, another one of those long-standing things. Um, like when he's like being a hard ass drill sergeant, like yelling at them, I got a serious, almost like a, a military movie vibe, mm -hmm. like a full metal jacket meets stripe yep. sort of thing. Uh -huh. When you have the, the fresh faced young recruit and like the, the doofy um, kind of classmen who are training with you mm -hmm. and the hard ass drill sergeant. Yeah. Did you pick up on any of that? Yeah, I definitely had like a full metal jacket vibe going definitely. on there. So, yeah, which I mean, makes sense because George, we, we talked about it when George, we talked about um, the. Dothraki and how George R. R. Martin is drawing from like history right. and that kind of stuff. So obviously he's going to draw. I felt that he drew. You from can draw from movies kind of, too. Yeah, something. which was nice, you know, because it was he's establishing this, and it very much gave me an idea. Even though I already knew what the Night's Watch was all about, mm -hmm. it gave me an even better idea of how militant it is and how much of like a brotherhood it is. So I mean, you get that idea on the show, but again, with George R. R. Martin right off the bat establishing things, that's you know, I, I really liked that. Yeah, I like that it drew on something to kind of familiarize myself with it. We also have, the, the, that was the, kind of the first part of the chapter. The second part is he talked to Tyrion a bit. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on the continuing evolution of Tyrion Lannister? Yeah, I mean, I do like the interaction. I mean, of course, kind of knowing where they go on the show, I do like the interactions between Jon and Tyrion just because it does feel like Tyrion is this guy who is kind of cast off to the side and isn't taken too seriously, even though he's one of the smartest characters in the game. Mm -hmm. And then there's Jon, who's kind of learning from him, who isn't exactly learning from him in a mentor situation. It's not like he's taking him under his wing. He's giving him nuggets that are going to come I mean, back and everything. So I feel like he's almost trying to be a bit of a mentor. Like, he yeah. doles out these little nuggets of wisdom. Mm -hmm. He gives yeah. him advice about... Um, you know, when they call you Lord Snow, just let it roll off your back, because mm -hmm. otherwise they're just going to keep doing it, which is yeah. totally true. It's the way, mm -hmm. like, 
you know, big brothers or antagonists work. Yeah. And he has experience with that because people called him the imp, half man, whatever, and yep. he lets that roll off his back. If he didn't, he would go insane. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it it and he's older than John, because John's I think John works better in the on the page a little bit because he again he's fifteen. Yep. So like it's easier to take him as like a surly, moody, little emo kid. Little emo Very kid. Very impressionable. Yes. So, yeah. Whereas when Kit Harrington, who <laughs> Who is just who's just like a full grown man does right. it. It's a it's a little weirder. It's more smoldering than it is anything else. I admit else. I, I did not like Jon Snow on the show at this point very no. much. Um I, I thought Harrington grew into the role, mm -hmm. but I didn't like him then in the in the early going. I think I like him better on the page in the early yeah. going. But yeah, it's like Tyrion is 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 trying to give him these little nuggets. Mm -hmm. What what draws Tyrion to to Jon Snow? What makes him want to be a, a big brother mentor type? Uh, I think big little brother. I think it's that outsider mentality yeah, that you know Jon's a bastard mm -hmm. and Tyrion's the imp. Who's and they're both kind of existing on the outskirts of their family. Right. You know because you know Jaime and Tyrion kind of have a thing going where Jaime likes Tyrion and you know Ned clearly has affection for Jon. So it's not like they're completely without their, you know, life ropes connected to the life rafts. Right. But they are outsiders. You know, Jon is not he's a, a bastard. Stark. He's yeah. a bastard. And Tyrion, Tyrion's while he is a Lannister by name, he's, you know, basically disowned by everybody except Jaime. So there right. is an outsider aspect that I think draws them together which is I'm so excited about it, which is why I think it draws them, or why it draws me to them being so drawn together. Because I love that interaction between the two. It is like, we're outsiders, we're gonna come together, and we're gonna make something out of this. So, yeah, it's I sweet. Like it's, that. It's, it's believable. And again, also long term forecasting, again, that relationship will pay off much, much later when oh, yeah. Tyrion comes back. It's about all that happens in there. Mm -hmm. um, he learns that Bran woke up again, which is nice. Yeah. But um, I think in the first book, like, I forgot how kind of. Little happens at the wall, really, yeah. in comparison to King's Landing. It's it's all just set up for, you know, the you Rowan's with regret later and the mm -hmm. battle at the wall and jumping with commander. It's it's pretty low key in the first book. Yeah. Any other thoughts on uh, this before we wrap up today's segment, Josh? No, I mean, pretty pretty solid three solid chapters. Stiff. I did like I, I made a note for the brand chapter that at one point the Raven told him that winter is coming, and I was like. There it is. Is that the first time we've heard? That can't be the no, first time. No, not I even thought, close. I was trying to remember. I was like, I don't think that's the first time. But Do a control F for winter is coming in this it book. It did stick You'll... out to me. I was like, oh, yeah, there you go. It did. I mean, mm -hmm. they set that particular line up yeah. so those three words could land hard. But no, they said winter is coming yeah. before. Like, Ned in his head is all he says. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think next week we should read um, the next Ned chapter and then the chapter after that. I was looking ahead which is, they're both pretty long, so I think two are good, oh. Tyrion. So Ned and Tyrion. Ned and Tyrion, all right. I think I already told you, we have all the people that we are gonna get in the heads of this book, we've met them all. Okay. So no new characters. That's perfect. That surprise you at all? I mean, there are characters I'd wanna get inside their heads of, but right now, you know, one of the problems with the show that is even people who are diehards, you kinda have to go back and look at the character names again and be like, oh yeah, that person. So. Kind of keeping it contained with the people that we've been inside their heads of. I don't want to get inside of too many people's heads. Right, not yet, anyway. Not Wait good for, for my own sanity. Anyway, uh, we'll be back next week at four. But first, let's announce the winner of the Game of Thrones Season 7 Blu-ray box set giveaway. All we right. got a bunch of responses. And the answer was, well, maybe I shouldn't say it in case all these names end up coming up. Um, Snake guys and something else. But the person who gave us the right answer fastest was Karen Nordmeyer. All right. Congratulations, Karen. Congrats, I'll be contacting Karen. you. Ask for your full name and address. Get back to me, and I will send you the box set. Don't get back to me. You'll have to go to the next person sending in fastest. So check your email, Karen. Congratulations. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll be back again next week, Wednesday at uh, 4 p.m. Central Standard Time for more Game of Thrones talk, more Song of Breath and Fire talk, and more A Song of Dan and Josh. <laughs>